Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about n-dimensional vectors um, and we will start with basically a summary of what we have already learned from the previous lecture about this. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Mass Plus and Problems presented in Unizor.com. On the same website you will find a prerequisite course which is called Mass for Teens and physics for teens and some other things like, like relativity. Um, so uh, I do suggest you to watch the lecture from the website. Uh, well, first of all, it's totally free. There are no advertisements, no strings attached. Uh, but what's very important is that every lecture is supplemented with detailed notes and on the same screen you have both the video presentation, whatever I'm doing right now, and you have a textual part, which is basically like a textbook with the same material. So it's kind of beneficial to compare, maybe, some, maybe I missed something, or I may, you know, just explain something differently than whatever I did with in the textual part of it. Um, now, so summary of whatever we know about n vectors, n dimensional vectors. First of all, n dimensional vectors are just a um, set of ordered ordered set of um, n real numbers. Now, with this set of sets, set of sets of n numbers, we do certain manipulation. And the first thing which we do is addition. So you remember that if you have two um, and dimensional vectors of the same dimension we can add them together and have a new vector which has um, we summarize component by component R1 plus S1 R2 plus S2 etc. Rn plus Rn, uh, Sn so from one set of n numbers and another set of n numbers, we form the third set of n numbers where every number is a corresponding sum. Now, this is very easy, natural, no problem with this. Now, it has certain properties. For example, one of the properties is commutative law, because if you will uh, change the order of summation that means you change the order of summation of each component and since the real numbers addition of real numbers is commutative 2 plus 3 is exactly the same as 3 plus 2 then on every place you will have exactly the same number as if you do it the other way around so they are equal and they are equal and they are equal so we have this commutative law also, again, immediately following from the um, property of real numbers, the associative law. So if you have R plus S plus T, three vectors, first you summarize it this way, R plus S, and the result uh, summarized with vector T. It's exactly the same as if you will do first S plus T, and then R plus the result of the summation. This is associative law. And again, it immediately follows from the corresponding associative law, associate, associative law for real numbers. Again, no problem with this. Third, prob third property of um, addition. You have something which is called zero vector, vector, which is basically n zeros. So in the first place you have zero, in the second place, etc., and the uh, nth place. What does it mean? Well, it means that any vector r plus vector, which is all zeros, we will call it null vector, will be exactly the same as original r. Right? Because if you will add, if s1, s2, etc., all zeros, that does not change the original vector. So there is a null vector. And, additionally, with every vector r, you have something which is opposite to r. And we will use 
the minus in front of it, which is basically the set of um, opposite numbers minus R2 minus Rn. What's interesting about R and minus R? Well, their sum is equal to no vector. Again, because minus R would be minus R would be added to R1, minus R2 with R2, etc., and you will have all zeros. So that basically completes our explanation of the properties of addition. So you have associative law, commutative law, you have zero, you have opposite, negative, whatever you call it. Okay, so that's one property. Another property. Another property is, again, we did address this as a definition in the previous lecture. Now we will talk about certain properties. Multiplication of vectors by scalar. Now, what is this? Well, that's basically multiplication of R1, etc., Rn, which is by definition F times R1, F times R2, F times Rn. So this is the definition of the multiplication by a scalar. If you multiply vector by scalar, you will get another vector. And that other vector is formed by multiplying by the same scalar, by the same real number, f, um, all the components of the vector, one by one. Now, what's interesting about this particular um, is uh, multiplication by a scalar. Well, first of all, obvious there is a commutative law. Because if you will multiply vector by scalar, that would be multiplication in opposite direction, r r r one f, r two f, etc. So obviously result will be the same. So this multiplication defined exactly like I defined it. So Rf is R1f, etc. Rnf. So by defining it this way, we come to a conclusion that this is um, commutative. Also, um, there is... Uh, what else? Scalar, okay. Um, sca uh, now we have, have another operation which is called scalar product. If you have two vectors, R and S. Now we have defined their scalar product as a scalar now. So it's not a vector anymore. It's R1 S1 plus R2 S2, etc. plus R N S N. So this is a very interesting. Now from the vector and vector we form scalar, just a plain real number. We multiply all components one by one and summarize them together. Now why do we do this? Because it's a very useful operation and you will see it further. However, right now let's talk about the properties of this. And um, the, the property, first property is obviously that this is the same as S times R. So we have a commutative property, obviously. Because if you will just change the order of multiplication, that would be exactly the same numbers. And now, using this, we will um, define the magnitude of vector r magnitude of vector r similarly to um, magnitude of the vector in two-dimensional case so if you remember if you have two-dimensional case and you have some kind of vector r 
this is R1, this is R2, right? The length of this and length of this. So what's the length of this? What's the length of the vector? Well, theorem uh, uh, Pythagoras, that's uh, square root of uh, sum of the squares, R1 square plus R2 square is square root. Now we will do exactly the same thing, but in this case we will do it using square root of R and R. What does it mean? Well, if you will multiply R by R, R by R, you will see R1 times R1, so R1 square plus R2 square plus etc. So for n is equal to 2 or n is equal to 3, we will have exactly the same as in two in three dimensional vectors, but we are expanding it to n dimension. So that's the definition of the magnitude of the vector. Okay? All right, so that's done. So that's basically square root of r1 square plus r2 square plus etc plus rn square. So that's what it is. So that's the magnitude or lengths or um, modulus of the vector and n dimensional vector r. Okay. Now, what else? Um, what else we will do the following? we will define an angle between two um, uh, vectors. Again, this is analogous to two-dimensional and three-dimensional case. You remember that in two-dimensional case, if you have um, angle between R and S. So, first of all, how the um, scalar product is defined in two-dimensional case, if you remember. So that's the length of one vector times length another vector times cosine of the angle between them. Now, in n-dimensional case, we have defined this and we have defined that one, so we can actually define the, the cosine between um, cosine of the angle between two vectors is by definition their scalar product divided by combined multiplication of their lengths. From this, we basically derive the angle in n-dimensional um, space. I mean, we, we don't really have any other way to define the angle, but if you have two uh, vectors, like two directions, if you wish, that would be sufficient to define the angle between two, um, two vectors. Now, there is a problem with this definition. We have to prove it's correct, but that would be a subject uh, of another lecture, na next lecture. But so far, just take it as a, as a definition. Now, what else do we have in n-dimensional in, in, in vector space? Well, we have something which is called unit orthogonal unit vectors. Consider vector A1, 1, 1, 0, 0, I2, 0, 1, 0, etc. and I n, 0, 0, one. So, the case uh, by order down vector has one on the case place and all other zeros. Now, what's interesting about this? Well, first of all, um, the lengths of each of them is equal to what? Sum of squares and square root. Now, sum of squares obviously is equal to one, square root is one, so this is one. So all of them have magnitude of one. That's number one. Number two, let's just multiply i m times i n. Two vectors can form scalar product. 
Now, what will be? If you will multiply one by another, you will always have one in different places. This is an nth place, and this is an nth place, and that will be a resulting zero. Now, what if I will have a cosine of angle between them? Well, cosine of angle is their scalar product divided by their multiplication of their lengths. Now, this is equal to zero. If m and n are different, then obviously the multiplication of each pair will be zero and sum will be zero. Now, this is one and this is one, as we have defined. So the result of this will be zero. Now, cosine of which angle is equal to zero? 90 degrees, perpendicular. So, these vectors not only have unit lengths, but they are also perpendicular to each other. So, any pair of different um, vectors are perpendicular to each other. So, we call them bases. And why is it basis? Because any other vector can be expressed as a linear combination of these. Take any vector R. Uh, R1, R2, Rn. We can express vector R as R1 times I1 plus. So that would be my one orthogonal plus R2 times I2 plus etc. plus Rn times I. So, by definition of multiplication of vector by a constant, you will have correspondingly, this one would be R1, 0, 0, this one will be R, R2 in the second place, other will be 0, etc. And when you're adding them together, you add component by component, and you will have R1, R2, Rn. So basically, we have represented them this way. So, any vector can be represented as a linear combination of these orthogonal to each other and orthogonal to each other unit vectors and the coefficients of this linear um, representation would be equal to exactly the components of our vector. So you can actually uh, say that R1 is a projection, if you wish, uh, of vector R onto the um, orthogonal, base, uh, orthogonal base vector I1. R2 is projection on I2, etc. Okay, so that's it. That's my theory. I just wanted to summarize what we know about n vectors. Now let's talk about a couple of simple problems. First of all, there is also not only commutative and dissociative law, there is also a um, distributive law, which is r r relates um, the multiplication to addition, right? So, I would like to prove that f plus g as a scalar times vector r is the same thing as f times r plus g times r. Now, I suggest you just to stop the video, pause it, and think about it. How can it be proven? Well, that's absolutely elementary thing. You represent R in the way R1, R2, etc. And if you will multiply F plus G by R1, that's exactly the same thing as if you will multiply F times R1 plus G times R1. So distributive law is true for real numbers. So component by component, these things would be equal, would be equal to each other. Absolutely the same thing another distributive law. That's my second problem. Again, think about this yourself first, but if you will do this, multiplication of scalar by sum of two vectors, that's exa exactly the same thing. Your distributive law works here as well. How can it, can it be proven? Well, think about it, but you know, 
in theory, you, you will just represent component by component, and the first component of this one is R1 plus S1 times F. In real numbers, that's a distributive, uh, distributive law is working. So it would be F times R1 plus F times uh, S1. And that would be exactly the same thing. So with distributive laws, these are my problems, problems, so to speak. It's really very easy thing. Problems A and B. OK, now let's talk about problem number C. And that would be a little bit more involved. And here, I don't think I will do everything. I will leave something to you guys for self-study. But I did put everything in writing in my notes for this lecture. So I have decided to do something related to real calculations. But in order not to overwhelm uh, uh, you or myself, actually, I have decided to do it in three-dimensional cases. So in our case, for this problem number C, my n is equal to 3 just to ease it. So I have two vectors. OK, this is my x, y, and z, three-dimensional. So I have one vector. Now this is O. So OA would be 2, 3, 4. Like 2, 3, 4. OK, so this would be my O A. Now another is minus two one three. Minus two is something here. One is something here. And three would be here. That's my B. So O A vector is two three four. And O B vector is minus 2, 1, 3. Now, obviously, if you will connect A to B, you will have a triangle. And what I'm asking is, I'm asking the lengths of all sides, OA, OB, and AB. I'm asking about cosine of all angles, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. It has three angles. And I would like to check that the theorem of cosines is true in this particular case. So now, why do I want to do it? Well, because we have defined certain things in the vector form. And I would like to basically show that this is really in conformity with our regular uh, consideration about geometry. I have decided to limit it to three-dimensional case, but basically it doesn't really matter. Our geometry in n-dimensional case should really be more or less like the two or three-dimensional geometry, right? So let's just calculate it. Now, how can we do it? Well, we know how to calculate the length of the vector, right? It's square root of sum of the squares. So we can do that. And if you will calculate it, you will have that the OA vector would be square root of what? 2 square is 4, and 3 square is 9, it's 13, and uh, 16, 29, square root of 29. Now, vector OB length would be 4, 1, and 9, so it's 14, right? Square root of 14. How about AB? Well, let's first of all represent AB as a vector. Now, you know that the addition of vectors is basically the addition of the components. So we know that OA plus AB should be equal to OB, right? OA plus OB should be equal to, plus AB should be equal to, uh, to, to AB. Component by component, it will be exactly the same. So what is AB? Well, we have to, so AB vector would be equal to what? I have to get, from 2 I have to get minus 2, so it's minus 4. From 3 I have to get 1, so it's minus 2. 
and the third component from 4 I have to get to minus 1. So indeed, if you will add AB to OA, you will get AB, because if this is a triangle, then again, in a two-dimensional case, it's very simple. Sum of this, sum of uh, x component, and sum of y component give you, uh, I mean, x component of one vector plus x component of another vector gives you x component of the sum of these vectors, right? So the same thing in any n dimensional case. So we have AB, so the AB length is equal to 16 and 4, that's 20 and 1, 21, square root of 21. So we've done this. Now, how about cosines? Well, cosines is, a, um, if you remember, cosine of R is R times S divided by length of R times length of S. So, let's say OA and OB, what's the cosine between them? Uh, okay, their scalar product is minus 4 plus 3 plus 12, which is 11, right? So that's their uh, scalar product. And we have this length. Length is square root 29 at square root 14. So my cosine would be, so between Um, OA and OB OA and OB would be 11 divided by square root of 29 times 14 okay okay now let's talk about cosine between so this is cosine between OA, OB. Now how about cosine of angle between OA and AB? Okay, this is a little trick. And here is the trick. If this is OA and this is AB, What's the angle between these two? Now, we are interested in this angle, right? The inside of triangle. But angle between OA and AB is not this one, because if you will, to, to determine the angle, you have to bring them in one, in one point to start from the same point. So if I will start, let's say, uh, from this point, uh, this is my AB, my OA should be here. So that's this angle, right? Now, how should I really make an angle between OA and AB, the inside of triangle? Instead of OA, I should actually consider AO, this particular vector in this direction. So that's negative, obviously, to OA. So vector AO is minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. Now I have to multiply scalar uh, product between AO and AB AO and uh, AB now what is the scalar product? minus 2 minus 2 is 4 minus 3 and 1 minus 3 minus 3 minus 4 and minus 12 right? so it's minus 18 am I right? no, wait a minute 4 minus, minus 11, am I right? OA, OAB, 11. Yes, minus 11. And I should use this and divide it by uh, multiplication of the lengths to get to uh, my cosine. And then the third angle is between OB and, and, and AB, but again, you have to really consider um, 
the uh, direction of the angle. So I leave the rest of this to you for your uh, self-study and all these calculations are uh, on the website uh, in the notes for this lecture. So that's basically it, that's all I wanted to talk about the um, general properties of um, uh, and, uh, and, and dimensional vectors. So read the notes for this lecture uh, and well, basically that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>